Hi, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Lester Knudsen, your host for today. And this is the uh, last in the series we've been doing of Informix tutorials. Uh, the complete uh, series is up on our website. And uh, at the end of today, uh, hopefully we'll have this last one up on the website too. Um, if um, you go to our website, log in, uh, go to Tech Info, and under all tech topics, there's Tech for Beginners uh, is the current page where they are. I'll have a special page for them uh, in the next few uh, days also. So let's dive right in. I'm Lester Knutz, and I've been working with Informix since 1983, and all I do is Informix. Um, I'm glad to, this is one of my favorite things to do, is these sharing information with you about Informix and how the engine works. This is uh, pre-recorded, so I will be able to answer questions in the chat. Uh, please use the chat button if you have any questions, and I will try and respond right away. Uh, please keep your lines on mute, uh, because background noise will distract everyone. And uh, so use the chat for questions, keep your background lines on mute. And with that, I'm going to start. Uh, this is what I'm going to cover. We're going to first start talking about OnStat and I'll, what I call the discovery options to discover uh, what's going on in your server, uh, some performance ratios you can use with OnStat. We'll talk about users and sessions, about measuring disk I.O., uh, monitoring locks. We'll do a deep dive into locks and a few other OnStat options, including uh, how do you read a shared memory dump made by OnStat? And then we'll talk about OnCheck and the basic uh, DB space checks, a little bit about OnMode, how to terminate a session, how do you kill a user session, and then I'm going to end up with some of these examples in Informix HQ. So the three commands we're going to talk about, the command line utilities, are onstat, oncheck, and on mode. Okay, let's dive in. Onstat is a, a built-in tool. It's great for monitoring what's going on. Uh, it reads the shared memory structures of Informix. Uh, it doesn't lock anything. But because it's reading live shared memory, the data might change as you display it. So you may do an onstat command, see some data, and then do it a couple of seconds later, and the data will be different because it's a snapshot of what's going on right now on the server. Now, it, it's up there. If you look at Informix memory, uh, it's basically reading data from these control tables uh, in shared memory. So let's start out with a series of what I call the onstat discovery commands. These are for you to discover information about your server. The first one is if you just type onstat minus. This tells you a lot. If the server is down, you'll get a message saying shared memory is not initialized for the Informix server in the name of that server. If it's up, you'll get a message something like this. And uh, what that is, is the product information and version. This is a key thing right here. That's the version of the product. Uh, the status, or the mode that it's in, and right now it says it's online. How long it's been up. And this is a lot of fun. Uh, we've had a contest to see whose server has been up the longest. And I think about three years, uh, we had a server that, that, that was up uh, for quite a bit of time. Uh, 365 days means your server's been up for a year. And then last, how much memory uh, this server is using in total. Now, the mode of the server, uh, if it's offline, it won't show up. Uh, if it's quiescent mode, that means it's in single user mode. Nobody can get in, it's for maintenance. Online mode is regular standard mode. Read-only mode is for an HDR server, and it says, I'm in read-only standby mode, I'm the secondary server, I'm ready to take over. Uh, that's what that means. And then recovery mode, every time you start up Informix, it automatically goes into recovery mode, you rarely see it. 
shutdown mode every time you shut down in Formix it goes into shutdown mode uh, again that's usually fairly quick now if the server is blocked you may see one of these messages and the one I've seen the most is the checkpoint message uh, you usually say checkpoint required or checkpoint in progress and that just tells you the reason the server is blocked right now is because there's a checkpoint going on now let's just dive right in on stat minus G OSI this gives you the operating system information and if I come over here to one of my servers and just tap type on stat dash G OSI I see that I'm on a Linux server uh, the name is Tiger 2 uh, I've got eight processors and all eight are online uh, this is how much memory I have which is about 16 gigs and then it tells me some of the kernel settings a good place to go to get the basic information about my server on stat dash G discovery goes out and says what other servers are on this machine and in this example um, it's showing two servers I have a server called train 1 and one called train 12 and train 1 is 1410 train 12 is 1210 FC 13 um, it will show you all the servers sometimes they'll be gone where you have upgraded uh, and, and you notice it does say this one is down um, it it basically reads what servers it knows about on that machine on stat dash C uh, log uh, on config shows you your on config file and this is really handy I'm just going to give you an example I do it on stat dash C pipe it through more I see my whole on config file if I do on stat dash C and I give it a parameter like locks it will tell you how many locks uh, so you can use this to find Now you have to know what the parameter is uh, I oftentimes when I don't know the parameter I'll do something like this on stat dash C grep and then I'll say let's say buff and I'll see all the times buff shows up uh, in in the onstat dash C. Onstat dash C shows you your DB spaces, and uh, this is key. Every DB space gets a unique number. Every chunk gets a unique number, and uh, this number one relates to this number one here down below. Uh, so DB space five relates to this chunk. Uh, chunk 5 I have a one-to-one -one relationship here but you don't have to do that uh, I have the size how much is free and the flags and the flags are really important uh, the first set of flags tell you if it's merit or not uh, the key one for DB spaces is this flag D, D down if you ever see a flag here in position 2 um, that is D that means it is down um, and uh, the chunk flags same thing D for down I for inconsistence N means it's being renamed and it may be down or inconsistent uh, temporarily uh, those indicate that something is wrong with your disk base on stat mesh L shows you your current logical logs and uh, depending on how many logs you have uh, I've got 80 logs here uh, and uh, let's just scroll up and see where the current one this is my current log the C is current the L means that the last checkpoint was done in that log um, and here's some of the flags with onstat L onstat M shows you your message log and uh, this is kind of handy quick way to find out what's in the online log now oftentimes I will do a tail minus F and uh, you can grab what the message log is here and uh, now we'll just continually add lines to that as it goes along uh, this server is pretty static right now so I'm not going to uh, spend time there onstat 
minus g sch shows you all the on and it processes. And this is very much like if I do a ps minus ef and a grep for on and it. Here are my on and it processes running on this machine. Now if I do an on stat dash g um, sch, I'm going to pipe it through more so it doesn't scroll off. Those are the 19 processes, and this class field is a key field. That tells me what, what they are doing. And um, the classes are CPU, which means it's doing the work. Uh, PIO, you'll have one of those for the physical log. LIO, you'll have one of those for the logical log. AIO, that means it's handling uh, disk IO for non KAIO request. And I've got a bunch of AIO ones that are all handling the disk IO. Uh, if you have shared memory connections, uh, you'll have an SHA one. The next three, uh, TLI and SOC, you'll only see them if you have them turned on. Uh, I have sockets turned on for network connections. This is a Linux box, and so Linux uses sockets. And I should have one socket uh, on a net there listening for network connections. Uh, you'll always have a FIFO one for uh, first in for at, first out file operations. Uh, optical uh, disk IO, uh, I never see that anymore. You'll always have an admin one. If you turn auditing on, you'll have an auditing one. You will always have a miscellaneous on a net on. Now, onstat-gsg shows you your shared memory segments. And uh, this is handy. Let's take a look at what we've got here. So I have uh, four shared memory segments. The R means that's a resident seg segment. The V means that's a virtual segment. The B means that's a buffer segment. If you do not see a buffer segment, it means it's part of the resident segment. In older versions of Informix, and I'm on 1410 uh, FC 4W1, which is the latest uh, version right now. But in older versions, uh, you didn't have the B. You, it was part of the resident. And then the M is the message segment. The asterisk means I have pinned those segments into memory so they will not swap out. Um, that is a, f a flag in your on config file uh, that you can set that will keep uh, the memory uh, pinned in, in memory. Okay, the next one I want to cover is onstat-p. This gives you statistics uh, that the server keeps track of uh, from the time you started out. Uh, it keeps counters in memory. And um, they show you a lot. And I want to talk about this. Uh, and you can see I've got the screen all marked up because there's a lot to say on this one screen. Uh, this basically has counters that every time you do a disk read, a ISAM action, a buffer overflow, a lock, uh, a counter gets incremented. Now these are integers and at some point they may go negative when the counters get so big. And so that's why it is a good idea to clear out the counters uh, every once in a while. And I'll talk about that later on. Um, but if you see negative numbers, that just means your numbers have gotten so big they have wrapped. Now, on stat-p, the first line is your disk I.O. line. And a couple of things to watch out for here. Uh, the first, it starts with disk reads, page reads, and then buffer reads. And you should see these numbers getting bigger. One disk read should have multiple page reads, and it should have many, many, many buffer reads. In fact, the percent right here, 99.63%, is telling you what percent of the buff reads uh, you're getting from page reads. That's a very good percent, and that's what you want to see. Um, if you see 
disk reads being big and page reads being small, you have a problem. That means to read one page, it's had to make multiple attempts to read the disk. The same for disk writes. Uh, you'll see disk writes, then page writes. Again, page writes, uh, there should be multiple pages being written every time you write to disk. And then buffer writes, uh, you should have multiple writes every time you write to disk. And then the percent cached. And uh, again, the bigger the percent is, uh, the better it here. The second line is what I call actions. These are your transactions. Uh, ISAM actions uh, is a total number of actions. Then you have open, that's opening uh, a table, starts, reads, writes, rewrites, uh, rewrites is, could be updates, deletes, and commits. Commits is a key one I, I like to watch because that tells me how many transactions I am doing uh, per hour. The next line, the GP line, you could ignore. That's pretty much not used anymore. Uh, the next line, the first three, over lock, over uh, user thread, and over buffer. In any of the later versions from about version 11 on, they should always be zero because they are dynamic. Anytime Informix runs out of locks, it automatically makes it the lock table bigger. And anytime it runs out of user threads, it automatically makes it bigger. Uh, and, and likewise, those should always be zero. What you will see that I like is the CPU time that the Onanet has taken. And to me, this is a key measure that tells you how much CPU time have my Onanets taken combined. And I've done several uh, performance tuning uh, operations where that's what we focus on. Uh, because I was once working with a vendor that was porting their uh, software to Informix. And uh, they were coming from another database uh, and they said, okay, we have this benchmark. It takes an hour. We do 40,000 transactions and Formix has to meet it. Default config, it met it. It worked. And they were like, whoa, <laughs> what do we do now? And I said, let's focus on the CPU time. And if we can make the CPU time smaller, that means and still get the 40,000 transactions, you can put your product on a cheaper box and um, have more users. And that worked great. Um, it also tells you the number of checkpoints and the number of flushes uh, that it did during the checkpoints. Then you have the weights, and this is a key line. Buff weights. A user has had to wait on a buffer. That usually means you don't have enough LRU queues. You'll always see some weights. Uh, that, will, that will never be zero, but the less the better. Lock weights. A user has had to wait on a lock. You'll see some lock weights. That's normal. Uh, a good ratio is what percent of your lock weights uh, to lock request. Uh, if it's less than 10%, I usually don't worry about it. If it's greater than 10%, that's pretty bad. Deadlocks, you want to see a zero. Deadlock timeouts, you want to see a zero. That means uh, you've got some coding problems uh, in your application and how it's doing locks because it's causing deadlocks. This is nothing a DBA uh, can do. Uh, this has to be fixed in the application. Checkpoint weights. How many times? So I've got 1,764 checkpoints. Uh, 747 times somebody had to wait because of a checkpoint. Uh, the less checkpoint waits, the better. Sequential scans. I wanted to highlight that in red. That's a key one. That tells me how many times you've had a sequential scan. And then the last line is a read ahead. I, I don't look at the read ahead that much anymore. Uh, because most disk and most SANs that we run on have big read ahead catches, uh, but I will show you how to read that uh, in just a minute. Now, so here are some guidelines. Uh, the goal of the buffer uh, read and write percent uh, for reads, it should be uh, greater than 95%, for write, it should be greater than 85%. Let's go look at one of my servers right now and see what it's doing. Uh, 
nonstat dash p okay i'm at 99 percent buffer read cache that's good 91 percent buff write cache that's real good uh, you can change the buffer parameter to make these bigger uh, i'm going to show you another uh, ratio in just a minute uh, called the buffer turnover ratio that i think is more important uh, now be careful if you make the buffers too large this will take away memory from other processes and may s slow down uh, your whole system buff weights this is how many times a user has had to wait for a buffer lock weights is how many times have they had to wait for a lock so i've got a fair number of buff weights a fair number of lock weights here um, though the zero would be nice those those are almost never zero on a good system deadlock should be zero and deadlock timeouts should be zero now four uh ratios i like to look at is how many kb and uh, am i reading and writing per minute and hour and i also like to uh, look at my buffer turnover ratio my buffer weight ratio and my read ahead utilization ratio and I have a spreadsheet I'm going to show you in just a minute that I cut and paste uh, items from the onstat and put them into the spreadsheet uh, I'll include the spreadsheet in uh, the notes uh, on our website for this presentation but I basically start by taking uh, from the top of onstat p uh, right here the uptime and copy it into the spreadsheet and then I from this uptime calculate how many hours and how many minutes it's been up now if you do on stat dash Z to clear out your stats you really want the hours and minutes since the last on stat dash Z was done uh, not how long the server's been up uh, that's why I have here enter hours since the stats were cleared um, and uh, it's a good practice I think uh, if you do clear your stats on a regular basis to do it at something like midnight so then I can at 8 o'clock in the morning say it's 8 hours since I did that uh, and plug in 8 hours here uh, because all these numbers will get reset to 0 every time you do an on stat dash Z now I just cut the disk reads page reads buffer writes uh, from this line I just do a copy and plug it right in here and paste it uh, yeah I'm not going to do that uh, because that will mess up my example here uh, oh two other things you got to put in how many buffers from the uh, on config file you have and I just add them up if you have different uh, buffer pools uh, just add up uh, all the different buffer pools we, we want a snapshot of how you're doing and then the default page size which will either be two or four and here is the default page size not the page size of each DB space um, now then what I do is I go out and calculate how many KB I'm reading and writing per minute and and this is this is the key thing uh, anytime you're getting a new SAN they're going to say how much IO are you going to do well I am writing uh, 2.8 gigs per minute I am reading 3.7 gigs per minute if you're doing replication that's what your network needs to be able to handle uh, this gives you the average reads and writes per minute the second number is the buffer turnover ratio and this is a good friend of mine Art Cagle came up with this uh, I've got the formula right there in the notes um, and uh, you take the uh, the page reads plus buffer writes uh, divided by the number of buffers and the time and it tells me I am at a terrible buffer turnover ratio uh, I, I have turned over my buffer 78 times in the last hour. Uh, that means I'm turning them over uh, about once every minute. That is trashing. Even though it looks good, 99% of the stuff is coming from the buffers, I'm still trashing my buffers. And um, 
what I have found over the years, if I can double this number, the number of buffers, I can reduce this in half. So if I went up to 3 million buffers, uh, I, I think this ratio would probably go down to half. Uh, and, and your goal is you want to get it down to about 10 times per hour. Uh, and it's very simple, uh, one number in your on config file, and that is the size of buffers. Uh, that will affect that. This is the biggest performance improvement change you can make, is getting this down to about 10 times per hour. The second ratio is the buffer weight ratio. And here, uh, the key thing is how many LRUs you have. Uh, when a user wants a buffer, if you only have a few LRUs, uh, they are going to have less chances to get that buffer. Uh, so I have zero. That's My system's got enough LRUs. I don't need to do anything about that. Uh, but if you have a very high, uh, greater than 7%, uh, it's a good idea to add LRUs. Uh, and again, if it's at 20% and you want to bring it down to 10%, doubling your LRUs will probably uh, help with that. The last one is the read ahead utilization. Again, I don't use this that much nowadays because I think SANS uh, do, do a good job. But this is saying uh, every time Informix does a read ahead uh, for index and data, index and for data, I add them up and then I compare them to how much read ahead was used. I'm only using about 30% of the read ahead. I am actually wasting read ahead on this system. Uh, now I am running on a very fast SSD drive. So that is one reason why uh, read ahead uh, is, is not so important. Uh, and if you're running on a very fast SAN, uh, read ahead is not so important. I would never make read ahead less. but um, what you want to do is get it up to 99.9%. Uh, .9%. Uh, that's the perfect read ahead if you, if you are going to worry about it. Now, let's talk about uh, the onstat commands to show you the users and sessions. onstat-u basically tells you all the users that are on your system. And uh, let me uh, get over here to another system. I'm going to go into DB Access and I'm going to connect and I'm going to connect as the user Lester. And uh, let's connect to my database. And if I open up another window on Train2, now if I do an onstat -u, I should see that, okay, there's Lester. Uh, I'm connected. And uh, the key thing in this is this is my session ID. And uh, if we need to kill our session, uh, that's what we'll need to use. And then I'll talk about the flags in a minute. Uh, that tells me if I'm waiting on something and then how many resources I'm using. Uh, this basically tells you who your users are. Uh, OnStat-X will tell you what kind of transac transactions they are doing, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. OnStat-G will show you their SQL. OnStat-GSES will show you uh, details about that. So let's talk about the flags. The first set of flags you see is there are a bunch that have F. That's okay. Those are um, page flushers, uh, D's and F's in that first column. Uh, let me just do it here. These are all background demons or page flushers. You don't usually need to worry about those. Uh, this P tells you that that's the primary flag for a session. Uh, in position one, if you're waiting on something, you'll see a, f you'll see a flag I've got a couple that are waiting on a Y, which is fairly common. That's waiting on a condition. A condition is an internal lock. And it could be very simple, like in my case, I'm waiting for input. Nothing wrong with that. 
Uh, X, if you see that, and the X's I have in red because they are the critical ones, that means I'm waiting on a transaction to roll back. In the second position, if you ever see an asterisk, that means you've got an error. In the third position, uh, if you see an X, it's beginning to commit work. A C means it's committing work. Uh, and position five, uh, if you see an X, that means you're actually writing data. And what I do is when I, when I look at this, I usually say, hmm, nobody's got an X there. Everything looks fine. If somebody has an X there, that's okay. That means they're in a critical section of work. And if a checkpoint has to happen, it can't happen until that X is cleared. Um, so the X is a, a key thing. Let's, let's, let's go in here and let's see if I have my lock one. because I'm in the wrong database. Oh, that's right. I need to, I, I'm connected as Lester. Uh, let me just go in as Informix, connect to Uh, now, if I do the onstat-u, you should see that in Formix right there, uh, I have a B for begin work. Uh, and uh, I'm doing some update uh, that that is doing. Um, onstat uh, minus x, this shows you your transactions. So this is the key thing I wanted to, to do. If I do an onstat-x now, you should see that I have, this is my thread, uh, and I know it's that thread if I do an onstat-u, and, and this is the way you, th you take these, uh, grep them back and forth. Here's the user thread in hex, and uh, the quick way to find out who that is is to do an onstat dash u and grep for that user thread. That tells me that's that's my my lock. The X though tells me that uh, they they are in log number 905, uh, and uh, that's when their transaction began, and that's the current position uh, of of that is still in 905. So if I do an onstat dash l to look at my logs. I can see 905, that's the transaction that person is in. So X is really good to take transactions and show what log those transactions are in. And this allows you to tie a log uh, to a user's session. OnStat-G SQL. This shows you the SQL that's going on. I've got a bunch of selects, and uh, I have uh, one here on the, uh, did I finish my? I did one. Let's, let's pick. Uh, Oh, wow. So that shows me I'm what kind of update statement you have. And uh, let's go back here to uh, these. Let's look at onstat g uh, 207. And that's against the SQ, SQL 207. Uh, that tells me the SQL statement. Uh, that that session is running. So you can break it down. I started to do it here and then I cut the rest of the slide off. Uh, but you can actually see the SQL that's running by doing an onstat-g SQL and then the session ID. So onstat-g SQL by itself shows you the SQL statements. Uh, drill in to a user by adding their session ID. 
Here's a second example on STAT-GSCS. Shows you a bit more information about these sessions. Uh, this shows you uh, some memory pools that they have, uh, a bunch of uh, lock things, and the current SQL statement that they are running. Now, threads. Uh, there are actually a number of things that you can you can look at. Uh, Informix is a multi-threaded engine, so one user may have multiple threads. And let me just run through these real quick. On stat ATH shows you all the threads that are running right now, and you'll see that uh, I've got some that are running. That means they're actually executing. Uh, a lot that are sleeping, uh, some that are waiting for I.O., and uh, here's one that's waiting on read ahead. Uh, but this tells you what's going on on your server. Now, REA would tell you if anything is ready to run. I have nothing ready to run. If I am wait, I do. That tells you all the threads that are waiting. Um, uh, on stat minus G uh, ACT will tell you what's active. This is what's running right now. I have two things running. Uh, both of them are connections. This is not a very busy machine. Uh, let's go over to my other machine on stat dash g a c t and uh oh, i finished my uh my little background task there so nothing really is running there either and then on stat dash g uh b t h will show you anything that's blocking now disk i o uh, the basic one to show you your disk I.O. is on stat capital D. And uh, I use this a lot. Uh, right here it tells you your, your page reads and page writes. And that's in page reads and page writes. So you can see from this, most of my reads and writes are going to the data B3 DBS. And uh, what you'd ideally like to see is a balance between your, your data. Now, in real life, uh, hopefully you'll have no activity on the root DB space. Your logs uh, will have a lot of writes, very little reads. So you want your logs uh, on your fastest disk for writing. And then uh, your data DB space uh, will have a balance of, of disk I.O. And your temp space, uh, this doesn't show it, but oftentimes you'll find 50% of your I.O. is to your temp DB space. Now, this is key to understand is the path uh, that data takes to disk. When you write a, a buffer, you update something, uh, in Formix, uh, LRU queues uh, wake up and say, okay, should I write this out to disk? And uh, Informix is multi-threaded and each one of these threads has a different job, a different part of it. Uh, and that way they can just focus on that. So the LRU queues focus on, on your LRU queues, your cleaner th threads get everything ready to write out to disk. And then your AIO threads uh, or your KAIO threads do the actual write. So your, your LRU queues are going to say, okay, do I have data to write out? Hand it to a cleaner thread, hand it to a AIO or KAIO uh, process, and then that will do the actual write to disk. And that way the, uh, the uh, LRUs can, can sit there and just manage the LRU queues they don't have to worry about writing things out to disk because once they hand them off to the cleaner threads, they're done. Cleaner threads, the same thing. Once they hand them off to a KAIO or an AIO uh, 
on a net, they're done. So to monitor those, we have a couple of other ones. One is onstat minus R L R U. This shows you, let's just see uh, what your LRU cues are. And LRU cues are always in pairs. Uh, and right now all of mine are clean because this system is not very busy. Uh, just for the fun of it, I'm going to go uh, back to my lab and run my benchmark again. Now if I do an on stat minus R, you can see, okay, things are picking up. My threads are getting, they're picking up. Uh, so now it's showing that uh, here's a, a uh, LRU, uh, here are the clean, and the F free means they're clean, M means they are modified pages. And uh, it's telling you when your start and stop cleaning is. Uh, so this is a key command to monitor your LRUs. The next one is the onstat minus F, capital F. And remember, we're, we're going through, uh, so the, the capital R monitors your LRU cues. The capital F monitors your cleater threads, but it gives you a bit more. Uh, what it does is it tells you if you've had any foreground writes, uh, how many LRU writes, and how many chunk writes. Now, I wish I'd rename these. Chunk writes are checkpoint writes. Uh, they happen at checkpoints. LRU writes are background writes. And on a OLTP system, uh, you want to have most of your writes be background writes. Uh, chunk writes may, uh, are very heavy. They're very efficient. Uh, so they're, they're not bad, but they can uh, take a lot of resources to do a write. It's like a boom, you know, a big write of data out to disk. LRU writes are very gentle. They're in the background. They're continuous. They're good. And you want to see a good balance between the two. Uh, you don't want to see any foreground writes. Foreground writes are really bad. That means the system had to stop. Uh, to write something out. And the reason a foreground write happened is all your buffers were full of dirty pages and you needed another buffer. And in order to get that other buffer, it had to write something out and it has to do a foreground write for that. Uh, so here's some information on that. Now, to look at the I.O. by on a net process, uh, on stat minus G I O V will show you that. So all my IO, AIO threads, uh, and this is what you want to see is a bunch of threads and all have a balance. They all look, I've got two that are really busy, uh, but uh, this is telling me my IOs per second, uh, how many operations they did, how many disk reads, how many disk writes, uh, how many times they've woken up, and then IOs per wake up. Uh, all these look like good, good numbers here. On stat minus G I O F shows your your I O by chunk, and this is a key one I want to point out. I O F. This I'm going to run through more because it will take forever. What I look for here is uh, if you have K A I O turned on, you'll have your reads and writes here. I don't. Uh, when you have K A I O turned on, they'll be down here, and these will be zero. But in either case, what you want to do is see 0 .00, greater than 0, .00. So these are really good. Uh, I don't have any. Uh, this is the average I.O. time. Uh, this, is, this is a busy disk. Uh, and look at my average uh, I.O. times. They're great. Um, that's what you want to see. I, and I've got very fast disks, so I, it's a hard, hard to show errors here. But if I come look at a system and you say 0.1, that's really bad. Uh, you've got very poor I.O. then. 
Now, another one, and this is a little bit undocumented, is onstat minus GIOF. IOH, I'm sorry. Pipe it through more. This shows you your IO history by for the last hour. Uh, so here's my IOs for the last hour by DB space. Uh, now it only goes back an hour, uh, but it gives you a detailed breakdown of what happened in the last hour. Now onstat-gckp also is key. This shows you your uh, checkpoints. And let me make the screen a little bit bigger so you guys can all see this. Okay. What I first look for, uh, this tells you why the checkpoint happened. Uh, checkpoint interval is normal. P log means my physical log was, was too small. And uh, it had to uh, do a checkpoint. Uh, user means I issued a command to do a checkpoint. Backup means I did a backup and it did a checkpoint. And as you can see I've, I've run into this a couple of times. What I really monitor with this is the block time. The block time should be zero or very small. That's how much time you're actually blocked. Now that doesn't mean uh, you may not feel it uh, but, but things are not blocked. Uh, but if you have a lot of data to write out, and here's an example, I have a lot of data to write out here. I had one wait at that time. Uh, so this tells you the block time, this tells you the number of waits. My block time was very small, but I still had a wait here. That's because I had a lot of data to write out. And uh, the key to reducing that is to uh, lower your LRU min and max. So you're writing more data out in the background and less data at checkpoints. Again, look at your LRU queues. Uh, on stat dash C. So right here in my on config, I have eight LRUs and I'm saying the min and max are at 50 and 60, which are the defaults, which is not really good. And uh, so I'm going to fill up 60% of that buffer pool before I start writing anything out to disk. And then at 50%, I'm going to stop. So when I have a checkpoint, I have 50%. And uh, this is uh, 3 gigs of buffers. So I have 150 gigs of data to write out every time I have a checkpoint. That could be a huge performance impact. So those are the three columns I look at uh, in checkpoint history. So let's take a look at how locks work. Onstat-K will show you your locks. The key thing it tells you is how many times the lock table has overflowed. Uh, and then it will tell you who owns the lock. Now you've got to do some detective work here. It will also tell you what table is locked. And on earlier versions you have to do some detective work there too. And it will tell you what type of lock uh, it is. So let's take a look at it. The first thing to look at in onstat-k is this last line. If you see lock table overflows, that means your lock parameter in your onconfig file is too small. So if I come over here and let's get a um, onstat-k I have no lock table overflows. That means I have enough locks in my onconfig file. But if you ever see lock table overflows, and that to me is in the top 10 performance tuning tips, uh, is to not have any lock table overflows. Because when the lock table overflows, it creates another structure in memory that it then has to search. Uh, it will do it dynamically. So it's not going to give you an error, but now you've got two or three or five or six or I've 
been places where I've seen 50 lock table overflows. And now you have 50 places in memory that you have to search before you can do anything. And every time you open a database, you have to place a lock. Uh, every time you read a row or open a table, you place a lock on that table. Every time you read a row, you place a lock on the row plus any indexes on that row. So the lock table overflow is constantly used. This is the busiest structure in Informix memory. And you don't want to see overflows. Now, I really like this. In version 14, you now have the table uh, name there. You used to have to go figure it out from, from this column, tbsnum. And I'll show you how to do that uh, if you have an older version. But in uh, FC4, uh, W1, 14, uh, the table name is there. So let's dive in and say, how do you tell who owns a table? Uh, the owner column has the hex address of the owner. And just like I showed you earlier, you need to do an onstat-u grep uh, with that hex address to figure out who the owner is. And then it will come back and tell you, and it will tell you their session ID. Uh, so let's take a look at an example here. I'm logged in as Informix. I did a transaction begin work. I'm updating uh, a, a customer record. And let's go find that. Uh, there it is. On stat dash K. So here, I've got two locks on the customer table right now. And uh, they're by this user. So let's take this user, and I'm going to do an on stat dash U and grep for that hex ID. And that will tell me the name of the user and their session ID that holds that lock. So now I can do an on stat dash G SQL 217, and I can see the SQL that that user is doing right now. So that's how you go from an onstat-k and take the owner and translate it to a user. Now, what table is locked? Well, in 14, it's easy. It tells you right here. Uh, in older versions, you don't have this column table name, and you have to tell it from this table space number here. And what this is is the hex address of that table. And uh, every table has a unique hex address. Uh, the 1002 is a special. That just tells me you have a database lock. Um, that, that's all that is, is a database lock. This is a table lock. And that's giving me the hex address of that table. Now, you can do a select uh, from sys tables. And you can convert the part number to a hex address. And that will give you uh, the hex ID of the table. So here's an example. I have two tables, one called Gen Journal, one called GJ Summary. And here are the hex addresses of those two tables. Now if I do an onstat minus L, boom, 9F. 9F is a GJ sum. That's how I know that is what is locked. Uh, again, table space, uh, the 10002 basically means that's a database lock. Every user will have a database lock when they open the, the database. And that's to keep uh, somebody from dropping the database while they're using it. Now, the type of lock. Uh, a database lock will be on the uh, space uh, 1002. A table lock will have a row ID of 0. So let's go back here and look at my, uh, my uh, one. This one, see that row ID is 0? That's a lock on the table. And it's an exclusive intent lock. And it says, I'm going to update that table. And that will compete keep anybody else from uh, updating that table at the same time. 
a page lock ends with two zeros. Uh, so let's come look over here. This does not end in two zeros, so that is a row lock. If it had two zeros here as a row ID, that would give me the page number that was being locked. Uh, a row lock will end in the actual row ID. A byte lock will have the size of bytes, and a key lock will have a F uh, something here in, this, in, in the key lock. But the key thing is to know that this is a row lock, and this actually tells me the row that they have locked. And uh, you could, in theory, uh, do a dirty read and find out what that row is. Now, the flags. HDR is a header lock. That's usually the first lock in a series. And there may be multiple locks, uh, but that's the first lock. Uh, the key flag, I think, is the uh, IX and uh, the X. Uh, X. X means exclusive. Nobody else can get to it. I means intent. So that means I want it locked. I may update it. Uh, the IX usually tells you you're about to update it. So if I come back here, you can see on the table I said, okay, I'm getting a lock on this table and I may update something. And here it says I'm actually getting a lock on this row and I am updating it. The S means shared and sh multiple people can have shared locks. Um, that's just a lock to keep uh, someone else from updating it while you're looking at it. Now, a couple of other onstat commands that I think are really helpful. Uh, onstat-r uh, re is a repeat command. And uh, if you're running a bunch of onstats and you want them to, to repeat, like I'm going to do an onstat-p-r, uh, dash it's going to repeat every five seconds by default. There it goes. Uh, onstat-z let me get to the right server here. Uh, clears out all the stats. So let's do this. On stat dash P, there are my stats. On stat dash Z is going to clear them out. Now if I do another on stat dash P, they're all at zero. Now even though it cleared them out, uh, it restarted them, there's been a little bit of activity since <laughs> see how fast activity happens. Uh, it's a good idea to do a onstat-z uh, on a regular basis just because if you don't those numbers may get so big they wrap and go negative. And what I like to do is set up something where uh, maybe at midnight I run a cron job that does an onstat-z uh, every day. Uh, you don't have to do it more than once a day. Uh, once a week is also fine but make it at a regular time so that um, you can say okay these stats are for the last 12 hours or these stats are for the last eight hours uh, so you can very clearly uh, see where it is now one of the really cool things about onstat is you can write uh, out to mem your shared memory out to a file and onstat minus o file name will create a dump of shared memory. Um, let's say your system locks up and everybody's yelling at you to get the system up and running. You don't have time to debug it, but you want to debug it. Do an onstat minus o file name, that will dump shared memory out. Then you can shut down the server, restart it, and uh, then you can go debug that shared memory file. And let me just give you an example of how to do that. So I'm going to exit out of this. I have a file here called onstat-save that I made on August 11th. Uh, I use the onstat-o option to do that. Now you notice that file is big. It's four gigs. Uh, it's going to be the size of your memory and so 
just as a quick example, yeah, it's going to be about this size. Uh, that will tell you how big it is. But now that I have that file, I can do an onStat, and I'm going to go into interactive mode uh, with the minus I, and I'm going to give it that file name. Now, instead of reading live shared memory, it's going to take a minute because that's a big file it's got to read into memory uh, here. It's going to be reading that file. And in interactive mode, I'm going to get a prompt like this. And now I can give it commands and say, boom. And it's showing me the stats from four days ago. Well, that's from the 11th. Uh, you know, that was, that was several days ago. I can, I can do all my onstat commands. And you see I get a little onstat prompt. Um, let's take a look at the flushers. Let's take a look at the LRUQs. I can do everything. Uh, I can do GSQL. See all the SQL that's running. Uh, nothing interesting was running here. But if something was, you could drill into what caused that crash. When you're done, control D uh, to exit out of that, and uh, you're done. This is very useful for debugging, and uh, I, I like to, to do this. Now, just remember, if you have 12 gigs of memory for Informix, it's going to create a file that's 12 gigs. That may be a lot to send around, uh, but it will give you a full dump of what was in memory at that time. Uh, again, so... I've saved a file with the onstat minus O option. Uh, I open it up with the onstat, uh, give it the name of the file and the minus I option. I'm now in interactive mode and away I go. Now let's talk about oncheck uh, and I want to just cover some of the basic oncheck commands real quick here. Uh, oncheck is different from onstat. This locks data. Onstat will never lock anything. Uh, on check will lock your data, so be very careful with on check. It's like the file system checker in Unix or check disk in uh, Windows. Um, it will go out and uh, and lock things. And it's a good idea to to run some of these, particularly when you do upgrades. I, I'm not a big fan of running these like every week. Uh, and here, what I consider my key on check commands. On check minus PR or CR uh, checks the reserve pages. Uh, PE checks your extents. Uh, on check minus CC checks your databases. Now, if you want to check your databases table and indexes, you give it a database name colon table name, and it will check all the rows and all the indexes in that table. Uh, if you have smart blob spaces, the CS and the C, capital S will check those, and the on check minus PT will check the partitions. Um, the key is on check runs in two modes. C, and let me give you a quick example of that, uh, on check minus uh, C, uh, CR, that checks the reserve pages. PR does the exact same thing, but it's going to print more details. And so it printed what was on those reserve pages. Again, on check minus CE will check all my extents. Uh, on check minus PE will print out the detailed information about all my extents. So there are two basic modes, the P and this and the C mode. Uh, now, if on check finds a problem, uh, particularly for a corrupt index, I think it's always faster to drop the index and fix it in SQL because you can use P PDQ. Uh, there are faster ways to, to build an index outside of on check. On check can fix it and it will prompt you, do you want to fix things? Uh, a good option to know with on check is um, the minus n option that tells you run the on, ch on check but don't fix anything or you can say minus yeah yes and it will fix things 
Uh, but if you say the minus yak, yes and it finds a corrupt index, you may sit there and be uh, fixing that index for hours with OnCheck. And OnCheck places a lock on all databases and all tables that it needs to access. I remember one time uh, I was working with a company. They had a new informant consultant come in. And uh, he thought he was being very wise and said, I'm going to check your database for you. And in the middle of the day on a production system, did an on check and the whole production system locked up. And uh, everybody said, what did you do? You just locked the database. On check will lock the databases if you're not careful. So here are some quick examples. Now, how to terminate a user and I want uh, on mode has a lot of uses uh, this is the one thing I want to point out here do not use the Unix kill 9 uh, because that kills a process without giving Informix a chance to clean up and roll back the transaction and I think the number one cause of corrupt indexes is people doing kill nines uh, on transactions. So if you have a lot of corrupt indexes, go look and see if one of your sysadmins is doing kill nines. You want to use on mode to terminate a user. And on mode provides a way to terminate a thread. Uh, it's aware of what's going on, so it will roll back that thread. And uh, it's much more efficient than kill nine. So let's let's do an example here. Uh, let me get on the same system. I'm going to do a DB access. I'm going to go into the benchmark 2 database and say select star from customer. And I've got tons of, this is uh, test data. So now if I do an on stat minus GSQL, I can say, okay, benchmark 2, I've got this thread 227 uh, let's see what that thread is doing it's doing a select star from customer so now I can do an on mode dash Z and that thread ID 227 let's go see if that thread is there 227 is gone but it's still here well what happens is the data is buffered up and so you can keep reading data until the buffer is empty and then the user will get this error message saying network received failed that means their connection to the database was shut down cleanly so it's not instant sometimes if you want it to be instant you can do a kill nine after you've done the on mode minus z and make sure you're doing it on the right user so the process to terminate a user's thread is to find the user's session ID. This is the key thing. And then do an on mode dash Z with that session ID. Now let's talk about Informix HQ. Okay, Informix HQ uh, is a wonderful tool that has a lot of basic information uh, that you can use for monitoring your server. And just as an example, I'm going to bring it up here. Uh, I'm looking at the Tiger One uh, server that we've been looking at, and it has some basic information here about my server. Uh, I can look at uh, my online log. I can look at checkpoints. Uh, I can look at user sessions. I can look at uh, threads that are running. Uh, I can look at my Onanet virtual processors. These are all different uh, onstat commands I just showed you. Uh, one of the cool things though I think about uh, this is I can go in here to schema manager. It's hidden. I wish they had just SQL over here. And go into SQL and I can put in any SQL command. And I need my cheat sheet here for this. Uh, the new API in version 12 and on uh, has a series of onstat commands built in. So I'm going to do onstat-g 
and then minus OSI and run it and it will give me the same output as if I had uh, typed that at the command line. I can come over here and let's just change this to a dash P and run it and it gives me my dash P output. Let me change this to a dash K. So you no longer have to be on the server to run on stat commands. You can be uh, remote on a different server as long as you're running in Formix HQ. And you can run all your on stat commands. It's execute function, sysadmin task. One of the tasks is on stat and then you give it the option. And every option I've tried works. Um, and this will show you your on stat command. So you could be on any any machine far away. I think this is one of the greatest things uh, about Informix HQ is the ability to monitor your server remotely. Now, they u this uses the Informix uh, SQL API. And you can also do this in DB Access. So I'm here in DB Access. Let's get out of this. DB Access doesn't matter what database I, I pick uh, as long as I say sysadmin colon task that tells me to run the task function in the sysadmin database and uh, boom I've got my onstat output so this allows you to be on a remote server uh, using DB access or Informix HQ and run your onstat commands uh, this was the last thing I wanted to end with because I think this is one of the best uh, new features built in there. Okay, let's take a, a couple of minutes for a question. Now, I'm going to uh, answer questions in the chat, um, but let me go on with just a few more slides. One is, if you're not a member of the International Informix User Group, please go join. Uh, it's the best thing out there for Informix users. A huge, uh, phenomenal source of information about what's going on with Informix. And there's some very good mailing lists uh, that they sponsor. One of the things that they're doing with IBM is a series of technical deep dives uh, on uh, 1410. Uh, and they did one on the SDK and in Formix HQ. Uh, they did one on replication. Uh, next week there'll be one on Java and System Admin, which I'm really looking forward to. And you can go to uh, the IIUG website uh, for events, and uh, and and you can register right here uh, for that event. Uh, like I said, this is. Uh, a webcast series we've been doing on tutorials. If you go to our website uh, under free tech info, uh, you have all of our WebEx uh, webcast replays. This is the one I did in July. Uh, if you go there in the next few days, you'll probably see this one up there. And uh, if you look at, uh, at, at all our uh, topics, right down at the bottom, I have Informix tutorials for beginners. Uh, and here are all the webcasts in one place uh, for uh, you to look at. The other thing we do is training, and we have one more class this year. We do private classes, and that's actually the, uh, the most training I do is, is private classes, and then we do public classes. And in October, uh, we have a class coming up. I think we have five people registered for the class right now, so there are three more spots. Uh, if you're interested, you need to uh, get your registration in. Once that class is full, it's full. Um, right behind me, I don't know if you can see it, are the training servers, and we have eight. And that's why the class size is limited to eight. Um, and. Uh, each student uh, gets a server, you SSH into that s server and uh, for the exercises. And uh, we use WebEx uh, for the lectures and the discussion. And it's an open mic discussion, so you can ask questions in the middle of, of, uh, of a talk, interrupt me, 
uh, that works out really good. And uh, that's what a, a better picture of our training room looks like. Last thing is uh, Advanced Data Tools does uh, consulting and support, uh, and we're here to help you if you need anything. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. I appreciate everybody attending. Uh, thanks to all of you who have attended all of the, uh, the webcast. Uh, I really uh, appreciate that. And uh, we, we will have uh, some new webcasts coming up. I have uh, two sort of in the works, and Tom and Mike are working on some. And so stay tuned, and we look forward to, uh, to seeing you on one of our future webcasts. Thank you all.